Prayers for the Lord's Supper will be offered at the end of this morning's lesson. Please pause the video now and gather the needed items for this remembrance. Thank you for joining us today online at the Pace Church of Christ. But we're continuing our series in James from James chapter 5, verses 7 through 12. And today's lesson is entitled, Give Me Patience and Give It to Me Right Now. Good morning. Thank you for joining us today at the Pace Church of Christ for this online lesson. Uh, we'll be continuing our study from the book of James. So if you'd like to get your Bible and turn to James chapter 5, we'll begin at verse 7 in just a few moments. Uh, we hope that all is going well in your life today. And we hope that uh, you and I are both seeing some light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, in many places, the restrictions on, on gatherings are expiring, and we all hope to be back together soon, face to face. But until then, we'll continue with these video lessons and pray that they are a blessing to you. As we begin this morning, let's bow together for a word of prayer. Most Holy God, we thank you for being our awesome God, for being the one true God, the God in whom we can depend, the God who has been so patient with us as we from time to time foolishly seek our own interest instead of bringing glory to you. Uh, Father, you have provided so much for us and you have reminded us, Father, in the midst of all that's gone on in the past couple of months of the value of family, the value of friends, uh, the value of health, and well-being, that you have reminded us, Father, of, of simple things like sitting down at the table with family and eating, of uh, playing a board game with those that we love, uh, of just talking with each other. But Father, you have especially reminded us through this struggle of the beauty of your church. And we're not talking about the buildings or the sanctuaries or the fellowship halls or the educational wings. We're talking about the people, because the church is the people. And Father, we know that every passing week, we are closer and closer to that time where we will be back together as the church face to face. And that eventually the handshakes and the hugs will come back. And we'll be together, worshiping our God together. But until that time, Father, we continue to pray for patience. Uh, that is, we go through this, this separation, uh, that we will trust you to get us to the end. Uh, Father, as we've gone through this journey, there have been individuals that truly have struggled. There have been those with health issues. There have been those that have experienced loss. And for those families, Father, that are, are fearful of what might happen, of those that are dealing with, with those issues. We pray that your presence is with them. We pray that there is comfort and there is hope. We pray for all of us, Father, that our faith in the midst of this crisis has been reaffirmed, that it has been strengthened. But Father, we are thankful that whether we are on those mountaintops or whether we're in those valleys, that as we go through life's journey, your love continues that there is no separation, that there isn't anything that can separate us from the love of God. And we pray, Father, that you will hold us in that love, you will wrap us in that love, and that you will strengthen us. Father, as we continue with this lesson and with our lives, may it all bring glory to you. For it's in Jesus we pray. Amen. The timing of patience from James chapter 5, the first part of verse 7. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. One of the most common flaws that we as humans have is impatience. I've entitled this lesson, Give Me Patience and Give It to Me Right Now. I took that from a, a statement that I heard somebody make years and years ago. It's this idea that we know that we need to be more patient 
in dealing with difficult situations. And we know that we need to be more patient with people. But at the same time, uh, we rush and, and we hurry and, and we get stressed and frustrated because everything doesn't go smoothly. Uh, the people who were reading this book from James understood that struggle. Uh, they had their share of difficulties. If you remember back in James 1, one of the first things that James said to these people, that if any of you lacks wisdom, you, you should ask God who gives liberally, who gives generously. But in that same context, James says that wisdom is going to come through struggle, through trials, through difficulties. And in that process, we learn patience, which eventually leads to maturity. So some of those lessons that we need to learn in life are not lessons that are going to come overnight. They're going to be lessons that are going to come through days and weeks and even years. And we want to have those skills, those abilities to have that patience immediately. But it just doesn't come that way. Again, for the folks to whom James wrote, their struggles were diverse. Uh, they were individuals who some dealing with, with poor financial situations. Uh, that particular thought has been brought up several times in this book. Uh, there were others where those who were self-seeking were making the lives of those uh, that worked for them uh, difficult at best. Uh, there were individuals who were speaking ill of them. There were individuals who were being abusive of them. Uh, they had their own struggles of, of putting food on the table, of taking care of their families. There were widows. There were orphans. Uh, there were all kinds of situations going on. And these people were struggling. And James has, has brought all this together as he comes to the close of this book. And he says to those folks, you've got to remember God's timing. God is doing everything in his time. Has God forgotten you? No, he has not. But we as God's people, James says, need to be patient and we need to be patient until the coming of the Lord. My friends, there's going to be a day when this world is over. Now, when is that day? I do not know. There is going to be a day when which coronavirus and cancer and flu and any other kind of illness will be gone. When will that day be? I do not know. There will be a day when there will be, as the book of Revelation says, no more tears, no more sorrow, no more death. When will that take place? I do not know. There have been many over the years who have speculated at when the Lord would come again. Uh, there have been occasions where people have stopped everything they were doing and just gone to the hillside and waited on the Lord. And those dates that they chose, thinking that this was the day the Lord came, those dates came and they went, and there was still no coming of the Lord. Could this be the day? It could. Could tomorrow, could next week, could next year be when the Lord comes? It's possible. Could it be a hundred years, a thousand years down the road? Absolutely. Absolutely. None of us knows when the Lord is coming. But until he does, we wait. We wait earnestly expecting that one day we will be in the presence of the Lord. And that one day the things of this life that caused us so much difficulty, that gave us so much frustration, that those things will have ceased. And we will stand in the presence of God. But when will God make that happen? It is his time.
timing. The Hope of Patience James chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. While we wait on the Lord, uh, we must remember that there is hope. One of the men that I have respected the most in my life was my uncle, James Irvin West. Uncle Irvin was a farmer. He raised cotton, soybeans, corn. And I spent many summers working for him. And there are many times when we would be taking a break in the field or when we would stop for lunch or whatever, I'd listen to him talk about the whole nature of farming. And I think it was because of him and others that I knew that were in the business of farming that I came to appreciate what James says here, that the farmer knows how to wait for the fruit of the earth. In the spring, the farmer would go out and he would plant the seed. And it would not be until later in the year, till the fall, that that harvest would come in. And there were a lot of things that could take place between the planting and the reaping. Uh, it might be rain. It could be too much rain or not enough rain. It, it could be the heat. It could be one of those unbearably scorching summers. And, and in the Middle East, they had various crops they planted at various times in the year. And they, like modern farmers, were dependent on on the rains and farmers would plant the seed waiting on that rain to come so that that plant might germinate. I think farmers may have some of the strongest faith out there because they understand they have to wait. And using that analogy James says we ought to have that same kind of hope, that same kind of expectation that the farmer did. That we also should be patient, that our hearts ought to be established as we wait on the coming of the Lord. Uh, that there ought to be in our hearts that confidence that God's got this, that God truly is in control. And that God is going to do what is best in his wisdom. That you and I would understand that we don't see all the details of how this world works. That we don't know all the intricacies of, of God's plan on a daily basis in this world and how God brings everything together the way he does. But we patiently wait on the Lord. And one day, that harvest will come. The Struggle of Patience, James chapter 5, verse 9. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. When we're dealing with situations that aren't going smoothly, uh, we have a couple of different ways that we can react. Uh, one is we can just laugh it off. Uh, earlier this morning, as I began the process of recording these various segments, uh, I was doing one segment and I was on at least the third take of it. Almost done with it, finishing up that particular segment and the power blinked. And everything in that five-minute segment was gone. And like I said, it was the, the third time recording it, and I, I was able to laugh that off. But did I feel that frustration? Oh, absolutely. There are times when we feel that kind of frustration, when, when something we're working on just isn't going smoothly, that we lash out at those around us 
that part of the struggle with patience is when we lack patience and things don't go the way we want, uh, we will grumble, we will complain against one another. Uh, and, and where it might be something that just happened, we look for someone to blame. Well, it's your fault that this happened. Or, no, it's your fault that this happened. Or, I didn't cause it. And we look for someone to be the cause, to be the culprit. Someone that we can blame as if that will fix the situation. So James says, I understand. I understand the struggle. I understand the difficulty of relationships with others. But understand that not everything is always going to be nice and smooth. And when it isn't, don't take it out on others. Find a way to turn that around. Find a way, like I said, to, to laugh it off it, if at all possible. But just because something doesn't happen the way I want it to, does not make it okay for me to lose my temper. Because when I lose my temper, when I lose control of myself, judgment is waiting. The examples of patience. James chapter 5, verses 10 and 11. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Whenever we're trying to develop or improve a character trait, it helps to have the proper instruction, but it also helps to have an example or examples of that particular trait. So if we're trying to improve our patience, then we want to look at some biblical examples that are given of people that waited on the Lord or people who patiently endured as they went through various struggles. And James provides two of those for us. In verses 10 and 11, James first mentions the prophets as a group. You can look at the individual Old Testament prophets, or you can look at them collectively and see that, that sometimes our perception of them is very different than what's actually in Scripture. Uh, there are many that hold to this idea that the Old Testament prophets were almost like religious celebrities, that everybody listened to what they had to say, and everybody was accepting of what they had to say, and, and they were viewed with with a, a form of prestige. Well, the opposite is very true. Many of the Old Testament prophets uh, were tortured, were abused, were ridiculed, were mocked, were treated with contempt. But they continued to speak in the name of the Lord. Uh, they endured that suffering and they waited on the Lord to deliver them. And they waited on the Lord to bring about the culmination of his will. The second example that James gives is one of a specific individual, uh, the man we know of as Job. I don't know how long it's been since you read the book of Job. It's a rather long book, uh, but it is a powerful story of faith and of trust. Uh, Job, at the beginning of that particular book, is a very wealthy, prosperous man with a large family uh, that he loved and that he cared for. And in rapid succession, he receives news that his wealth and his family had been destroyed. And what he had left were people like his wife who were telling him just to curse God and die. Uh, he had friends that were saying, you must have done something wrong for God to put you through all of this. And, and did Job uh, gripe? Did he complain? Did he, if you will, vent to God? Oh, absolutely. 
Uh, Job chapter 3 is, is one of the most heartfelt, grief-stricken chapters of the entire Bible, where Job is asking God why and wishing he had never been born. But over and over through the, the bulk of that book, Job is asking God, why is this happening to me? I've examined my life. I'm trying to live right. I'm trying to do right. I'm trying to please you. Why am I suffering so? And when you get to the end of the book, Job really doesn't get the full answer to that. God speaks to Job and, and asks Job, where were you when I set this in motion? Or where were you when I did that? And the rhetorical answer is Job could only say that he had no understanding of that, that God is supreme and that God is all powerful and all knowing. In the end of the story, God restores to Job his wealth. God expands his family. And God lifts Job back up to that position of of prestige that he had. But Job's story ended with God putting Job where he wanted Job to be. It is a story that shows the compassion and the mercy of God. These two examples remind us that what we go through in this life, no matter how difficult it is, First off, it's part of a larger picture. We sometimes can only see what's going on at the moment. God sees beyond the moment. God is seeing how this is going to work out in the end. But as we've said on other occasions, whether it be on the mountaintop or in the valley, God is in both places. And his mercy and his compassion, his love is there with us. And as the Hebrew writer would say in Hebrews chapter 13, the Lord will never forsake us. He will never turn his back on us. He will never desert us. We must patiently wait on the Lord. We must allow the Lord's will to be done. The language of patience, James chapter 5, verse 12. But above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth, or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes, and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. James concludes this section on patience by reminding us about what we say when we go through these struggles. He's already mentioned in verse 9 that we ought to be people that when we are frustrated, when we're feeling that stress, uh, that we don't grumble and complain and project our frustration onto others and take it out on them. That we control our temper, and part of controlling our temper is controlling our tongue, which he's already addressed at length in chapter 3. Well, as he comes to this, this close, and, and he talks about the language of patience. Uh, there are times when we're going through struggles uh, that we might exaggerate. We might overly emphasize something. We might make the situation actually sound worse than it is. And so in their culture in the first century, people were used to making oaths. Uh, they might swear by heaven, or they might swear by earth, or they might swear by the temple, or the gold of the temple, or any number of things, as if they had to swear by this so people would think that what they're saying was the absolute truth, that there was no exaggeration, there was no hyperbole, there was no uh, making the situation sound worse than it is. So James quotes from Jesus himself and what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, that we are not to swear at all, but our conversation, our integrity in our speech 
ought to be such that when we say something is so, it's not really questioned. That our yes is understood as yes. And if we say no to something, that that's understood as no. Otherwise, we're going to fall into judgment. Uh, there are individuals we all know that you have to take everything they say, as the old proverb goes, with a grain of salt. There are even those individuals that we may know that everything they say needs to be taken with a box of salt because they so tend to overstate and exaggerate what's going on. James says, our speech, particularly in those times of frustration, particularly in those times when we need patience, needs to be tempered. It needs to be such that we are under control and that what we are saying can be trusted. God has perfect timing, never early, never late. It takes a little patience and it takes a lot of faith, but it's worth the wait. Statement by Anonymous. God's timing, that's really what we've been talking about today. When we're waiting on the Lord, when we're patiently enduring, when we're holding on, waiting for things to change, it's about trusting God to do things in his time. God's timing indeed is perfect. He does it at the right time, not early, not late. Our task is to trust. Our task is to wait. Do you know there comes a point where we don't need to wait? God has patiently waited on all of us. God wants all of us to come to salvation. But there are times that we wait when we need to act. It may be that some of the folks that have been listening in to our series on James are realizing more and more with each lesson that their relationship with God is not what it ought to be. For some, that means they need to take that initial step of being baptized into Jesus Christ as they have repented of their sins. That they need to allow God to wash their sins away. Yes, there are times that we wait on God. But God may be waiting on you to make that step. He's not going to force himself on you. But God wants you to come to a relationship with him. And isn't this a good day to do that? As we've said in several of these lessons, if at any point you decide that today is the day you wish to be baptized into Jesus Christ, that you wish to come in contact with the blood of Jesus that washes away sin, if you'll go to our church website at pacechurchofchrist.org, and get our email or get our uh, phone number for the office, we will get back with you and make arrangements for that to happen. But there's a lot of us that are Christians, and we have been walking this journey with the Lord. And some days we do well, but a lot of days our frustration bubbles over. A lot of days we are impatient and even hostile in our tone toward others. What we need to do is turn back to the Lord. Ask for Him to lead our life. Ask for that wisdom from above. Ask God to help us develop patience. To understand that there is a better way than what we have done. Prayers for the Lord's Supper will be offered at the end of this morning's lesson. Please pause the video now and gather the needed items for this remembrance. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, 
blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Matthew 26, verses 26 through 28. One of the most special parts of our assemblies is when we gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ to commemorate the Lord's Supper. And we remember back to the stories in Scripture of that night when Jesus instituted that feast. When he took bread, and he broke it, and he blessed it. And he said that this was his body when he took the cup and he shared that with his disciples saying to them that this was his blood and that it was part of a new covenant that he was making with mankind and it is that new covenant that started with the death burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ that has forever changed our life Today, you and I as brothers and sisters, though separated by distance, will partake of that bread and that cup to remember the death of our Lord, to remember that covenant that he established, to remember the salvation and the forgiveness that he has brought to our lives, to remember that by his death, we have been given freedom from sin. So each Lord's Day, as we partake of these elements, we remember. We remember the Lord and what he accomplished in his life and in his death. Would you bow with me as we give thanks for the bread? Most holy God, we thank you so much for the body of Jesus that was given on the cross. And we realize that this bread represents that body that hung there. And Father, we realize that it was because Jesus sacrificed himself, that Jesus was sacrificed on the cross by your great love, that we have freedom and hope and assurance. And Father, as we partake of this bread, may we remember, may we commemorate the greatness of your sacrificial gift. It is in Jesus we pray. Amen. Would you bow with me again as we pray for the cup? Father, I know for so many people in this world that the idea of blood is a grotesque kind of topic. But it is the sacrificial blood of Jesus that saves us. He voluntarily went to that cross and his life blood poured from his body for us. And Father, as we take this cup, we remember the blood that was shed and we remember the power of that blood, the transforming power that took us from darkness into light. And we give thanks, Father, that Jesus came and died for us, that we might be whole. It is in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. We are very glad that you joined us today for this lesson from the Pace Church of Christ. And as always, we pray it has been beneficial to you. We are nearing the end of our study of the book of James. We only have one lesson left from it, and that is from James chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. The lesson will be entitled, The Power of Prayer. 
Anytime that you are in the area of Pace, Florida, we would be very honored if you would join us for our, one of our worship assemblies or one of our Bible classes, or just to stop by the office and say hi. Until our next gathering, uh, we pray that the Lord will bless you and that the Lord will keep you.